Good day, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to all of you. Let's wait a minute or so for people to join the webinar, and then we will start. So today we'll be talking about zeroing in on science-driven action, climate action specifically. Uh, this webinar is hosted by ECLAS Carbon Climate Center, and we are on the 15th of December towards the end of 2022 after a very hectic year and an interesting climate COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, where the focus was not so much on climate change mitigation, but very much on adaptation and resilience. So I am delighted to um, share with you, we will have uh, three speakers today, uh, Tabari Kurash, the global technical lead and expert of WWF cities, uh, working for WWF Sweden, so he will be talking about the importance of setting a science-based target. We have Ryan Green from C40 as the Senior Technical Manager on Climate Action Planning and Innovation, talking about moving from a robust greenhouse gas inventory to a science-informed climate action plan and the fun dimension of climate action planning. And I myself will be talking um, about how the global climate initiatives connect to, also to the work that ICLA is running. Uh, my name is Marijke van Staden. I'm the director of ICLA's Bond Center for Local Climate Action and Reporting, called the Carbon Climate Center, and also the director of business development for the ICLA World Secretariat. Without much ado, I would love to hand over to uh, Tabare to show us what is exciting about the science-based target. So let me stop right here and hand over to Tabare, who will be sharing his screen. So there we go. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Marike. It is a great honor to be in this webinar. Uh, let me tell uh, the audience that I was particularly excited to, to this invitation because indeed, uh, science-based targets has become um, a concept that it is nowadays in the, in the slang of, of, of the climate conversations. And many times we don't really understand why we talk about science-based targets. So uh, today I will try to, or I'll do my best to, to guide you over that concept, which is really interesting. And I'm sure, or hopefully after this uh, presentation, you will see that it is not rocket science what we're talking about when we talk about science-based targets. We're actually talking about manners in which you, your families, your local governments, your countries can meet the society needs within the earth limits. So let me start saying a little bit of, um, what does science-based target mean? And I would like to tell you a little bit of an anecdote. And you, we all are aware that back in 2020, or the, the year 2020 has been a, well, a, a paradigm and it will remain the books of history for a for, for long time. So we have the, uh, uh, the, the, the global pandemic crisis and back in those days, uh, an, an international group of, of, of organizations called the Global Commons Alliance, we celebrated the, the annual gathering, the Global Commons Alliance. Uh, it's, a, it's a group of organizations that are focusing in basically uh, supervising or, or, or guarding the, the limits of their, in a way that it, the planet can sustain people, economies, and, and biodiversity. And back in those days, when we celebrated uh, the, the annual gatherings, one of the brightest minds of uh, the contemporary times, Professor Do uh, Dr. Johan Rockström, he made this, this statement that, that really changed my mind uh, after listening to it. And I'm gonna take the liberty to read it. He said that the, the global commons relate not only to how the great biomes regulate the earth's natural systems, but also the way we manage these systems in terms of health and justice, so basically well-being. Dr. Rockstrom, he contextualized this, basically for in the moment that we were living, the pandemics, and clearly explaining us how the push of the natural frontiers caused by the triple crisis, environmental triple crisis, call it climate change, loss of biodiversity and accumulation of waste, has been pushing the frontiers that uh, in a predictable manner will force uh, the, the zoonosis, which is the, the leaking of viral disease from animals towards a globalized society. So in this context, when we uh, approach this, we were basically talking about the limits of the earth to sustain life, societies, and economies. 
And that is basically what a science-based target is. Science-based target is a manner, is an approach for us to define what are those limits that we can measure and those limits in which we can action uh, uh, for in order to, say, to be safe and to be developing in a fair manner. So there's not really a global definition of what a science-based target is, but what we can put it in simple words is that uh, a science-based target is a measurable and an objective and an actionable objective that it is focusing in safeguarding environmental limits and social sustainability. When we talk about science-based targets, we can talk about nature, we can talk about biodiversity, fresh water, forest, uh, oceans, and particularly climate. And when we talk about objectives, we define objectives from a social perspective as the way cities are planned, as the way companies are uh, uh, producing or manufacturing things, or as investors and taking uh, decisions. So when we talk about climate uh, actionable, measurable science-based targets, what we are talking about are, what are those things that we can do in order to safeguard our climate, limit global, uh, global warming in line with our aspirations to uh, preserve social sustainability and the environment. So what does this really mean uh, for cities? So how can we translate this into what, are, what is a safe limit and a fair limit for a city? When we talk at the global sphere, sometimes it's a bit more easier than when we're talking at the, when we try to download this to the local level. So I'm gonna try to, to tell you a little bit what it is a safe limit. And, and I put this graph uh, a little bit to mock uh, on the question because what it is a climate safe limit is probably a question that we should have asked ourselves 200 years ago when the industrial revolution started and when the, we started emitting greenhouse gas emissions. Today, the science has a study for many decades what has been the impact of the accumulation of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and how the dynamics of these are portraying global warming. So a safe limit is very clear. The more emissions we have in the atmosphere, the warmer will the planet get. So the safe limit is zero emissions. That's basically it. So what we need to focus on when we talk about a safe limit for the climate is to reduce it to zero the emissions in order for us to avoid further global warming. And I say further global warming because the ongoing emissions that we are uh, emitting, those that have accumulated in the atmosphere are already creating some global warming. And now the general consensus is that to avoid the worst cases for, global, uh, for climate change, what we should be aiming for is at limited, limiting the emissions at least to uh, an expected global warming of 1.5 degrees. So that's a safe limit according to the consensus and the science, uh, uh, the current science. But that of course is even more complicated because what does this mean for the cities when we are talking about the distribution of how much emissions can be emitted on who needs to reduce more, who needs to reduce faster? And that's when we jump into the other part of the conversation, what it is fairness. And this is also something that it is quite subjective. There's no really a, a global agreement on what is fair, what is equitable, what is just. But I think this graph kind of helps us understand a little bit what do we mean when we talk about a fair distribution of the burden? This graph, what it is showing us is the countries that emit the more and the countries that suffer the vulnerability of climate change the more. So the darker and the red closer you are to, to as a country, the more emissions you have, but the less impacts on, on global warming, on climate change, you will experience at least as projected by 2030. So this is a very shocking graph in my view, because what we can see is that those countries in red, which are the countries that emit the more are those that experience the less impacts on climate change. And those that are in green, are those that emit the less and experience the more global warming. So this is kind of the fairness that we're talking about, the way that we can somehow uh, balance the, the negative impacts of climate change, uh, that we can also redistribute the burden in the emissions reductions that are committant to that uh, objective of limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. 
So a little bit in summary, when we talk about a science-based targets for climate, for city, it's kind of simple. We're talking about community-wide emission reductions efforts that help us reaching net zero emissions. And that these are reflected with ambitious actions that uh, are in accordance to or differentiated responsibilities and capacities to implement. Um, you might notice in here that I have highlighted in red the word zero. And I, I, I really want to emphasize on that. And for this, I bring another anecdote that hopefully you will find interesting. In the past COP27, uh, this uh, gentleman, Professor Dr. Nicholas Huni, who is uh, another huge bright mind in the climate uh, uh, debates, is a climate policy scientist, co-founder of the New Climate Institute, professor of Wageningen University and IPCC author. He presented in a press conference the stock take of the net zero commitments by, by, by countries, by companies and by cities. And he made a very powerful statement that I also would like to bring to you. And the powerful statement is that the good thing about reaching net zero is the zero, it's not the net. And again, to emphasize the message, what we are talking about science-based target and probably the most scientific target that we can ever define is reaching zero emissions. Reaching zero emissions in a moment of time that it is a little bit uh, between 2040 and 2050 as the fastest possible way. And we say a little bit because of course the implications of delaying that might bring a limited overshoot of the temperature. So that is that we will keep emitting some emissions before the global uh, atmosphere stabilizes at one five degree global warming. Or if we do it faster, we might even avoid that overshoot. And in here, another important question emerges. So to go outside to the world and say, we're gonna become zero, it's an excellent first step, but this needs to be, uh, this needs to come together with a second very important thing, which is the definition of stepping stone, stepping stone targets that are in line with that 1.5 degree. If we think that we can reach uh, zero emissions by just defining the target, 20 or 30 years time from now, and we just work business as usual to see how far we can get without having these stepping stone targets, it will be very likely that we will not gonna reach our objectives. So to this purpose, a group of organizations that include C4E, the Global Covenant of Mayors, WWF, ECLE, CDP and the World Resource Institute, we have developed a guide for cities that can direct us, that can help us define how these stepping stone targets look like based on science, based on equity considerations, based on methodological completenesses, and more importantly, the usability of tools and approaches to define those targets. I really recommend the audience to look at, the, uh, to look at this uh, guidance because it, it assesses a couple of methods that exist out there the deadline 2020 from C40, the One Planet City Challenge 1.5 alignment approach, the Tyndall, uh, Tyndall Center method for carbon budget in cities. Those approaches guide us uh, on managing which we can define these stepping stone targets that are a complementary element of the nature of what is becoming science-based tar targets. And I, I think I'll take an opportunity in here to mention a little bit what it is a science-based target network. And the science-based target network is a, a group of 50 plus organizations that are precisely working on these approaches and tools to define targets for earth in terms of climate, water, land, oceans, and biodiversity for both businesses and cities. And when we talk about cities, the, 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 the leading organizations working on this are those the same ones that have produced the guidance that I mentioned before. This, this organization, we have been working together in assisting in finding manners to guide the cities towards the definition of these targets. And back last year, um, we make a, a small research 
uh, looking at the information that City has been disclosing to the CDP eClay Tracker. For those that do not know, CDP eClay Track is the world's leading climate reporting platform and progress accountability mechanisms for cities. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific uh, platform that collects, compiles, assess information that it is publicly disclosed by cities. And we study the targets of over 1,000 cities that reported in 2021. And what we saw is that only about 10% of those have uh, embedded, they have adopted science-based targets. And, and on the one hand, this is very inspiring because we have cities that are going to the next step, that are showing the leadership to the world. We have, we have seen the targets regardless of their dimensions, the political status, the economic development, they are capable of having these sort of targets. But the other part is that we have seen many other targets that they have not done so. So we have seen a, a large majority that uh, have done an extraordinary effort to define targets that yet do not align with that overall goal of reaching zero emissions and having interim targets that align to 1.5 global warming. And we have an important number of cities that they have not even set up a target. So with this, I would like to finalize my, my comment, Maraike, just with one final set of, of, of uh, reflections. Why these science-based target conversations matter at all? And, and I think there are three uh, particular reasons of, for why we are talking today about uh, science-based targets. And the first one relates to that uh, statement in orange, our climate is our future. So the decisions that we take today will have major implications for what it is gonna to happen tomorrow. And when we define a target that is not aiming and preventing the worst cases in the near future, what we're actually doing right now is defining a negative future for everyone. So I think the first important thing about science-based target is that it is really the guidance for a safe and fair future for everyone. The second thing is very similarly, the decisions, the way we populate by actions and, and, and strategies, those targets will also have implications to many other parts of the world beyond our cities. So in a world where we have over 4 billion urban residents and they commute to many places and they consume goods and services from many places and they uh, uh, move around the world, well, whatever the way we define those targets will have implications to many other human, natural and eco economic systems. And that's why it's so important that when we talk about science-based targets, we are talking about community-wide, all greenhouse gas, various sectors targets that they all little by little do the contribution to that reaching of net zero emissions. Finally, a fair reason why we need to have uh, targets. Well, targets is basically an opportunity, an opportunity for systemic transformation, for accelerating sustainable development and responding to many of the challenges that we have nowadays. So to finalize, no matter where you are in your city, in what process of your climate city journey planning uh, you are at the moment, you can always have, a, uh, you can always revise your targets, you can define science-based targets, you can create action plans to those targets. And there are many organizations that are really keen, really happy to help, to help you in doing so. So I'll stop here, Marike. I hope this has been a good introductory uh, conversation for us to move to the next uh, set of slides. Back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tavare. Um, this was very inspiring. I also loved your summary, the three, the our climate is our future. It's a very powerful statement. And it's lovely to see that reference to the summary of urban policymakers, which is a really important document as well. Um, we will take questions at the end. Um, so I would just very much uh, wish now to introduce you to Ryan Green. So Ryan, you've uh, been working with us also on the science-based targets piece, of course, uh, from C40. I've already introduced you uh, at the start. So without much ado, may I give you the floor and we're curious to hear about climate action planning. Thanks so much, Marika. Firstly, I must apologize for being a few minutes late. I was having some internet difficulties on my end, um, but it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm um, yeah, more than happy to give some slides and, and some background to our climate action planning work at C40. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. 
Could you give me a thumbs up when you can see my slides? Yes, we see it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, a picture that I found on a, a Guardian article during COP, and it was the 20 best pictures that illustrate the climate crisis. And it had a great quote on it by um, a guy called David Simon, who was the writer of The Wire, who said that something paraphrasing here, but something in the lines of in the pantheon of visual metaphors for America right now, this really takes the biscuit for me. And I just think that, you know, if you can demonstrate sort of inaction in the face of a crisis, having a fire in the background of a, of a golf course really kind of sets the scene for me. Um, but I'm going to move uh, a little bit away from just talking about science-based targets and talk a little bit more broadly about climate action planning at a city level uh, and how that really begins with a, a robust greenhouse gas emission inventory. Um, so on my, ooh, see if I can go to the next slide without it jumping back. Hmm. There we go. So yeah, why does the climate action journey start with a greenhouse gas emission inventory? Um, yeah, the first step for city practitioners um, is to really understand what sources of emissions are being generated within the boundary of the city, uh, where who those might be responsible for, where they might be you know, originating from in terms of fuel or activity. Um, and this really is the kind of first step in the cycle of evidence and action. Um, and this uh, sort of this diagram here is uh, an expansion of that idea really of evidence and action, where the first step for a city is to develop that greenhouse gas emission inventory uh, and then take steps to understand what a, a future emission forecast might look like and then set an ambitious emission reduction target from that. That you know, really links back to Tabare's last piece around science based target setting. Um, and linking that to you know, future projections of emissions and future strategies. And using that as a key evidence base in establishing and adopting a climate action plan at the city level, uh, and then moving into the phase of implementing those actions, monitoring progress against those actions, um, and then you know, bringing you back to the beginning of your planning cycle to revise uh, you know, how much success you're having with those actions, revisit that evidence, have a look at um, you know, where, emissions or behaviors are, are, are achieving the result which you're looking for from those actions um, and, and revisit and um, yeah, revisit those and re-strategize around your actions and your plan. Um, so this is really the kind of starting point for the mitigation side of climate action planning for cities. Um, and I think you know, it, it rings true with that notion of science-based target setting that if you're gonna have a robust science-based target, it has to be grounded in, um, in evidence, right? I mean, yeah, the the, the term science-based targets is something that's you know, uh, become certainly the the sort of the used practitioner term when talking about uh, you know emissions targets that are aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement and planetary boundaries. Um, you know, the precursor to that was evidence-based targets. I think you know, for me, the key is setting those targets in line with uh, with that evidence base. Uh, and adjusting you know, your, your, your level of trajectory of ambition in line with that uh, and making sure that you're grounding that target in as good to uh, as close as the most robust picture that you have of the city's emissions. Um, and also you know, other aspects, whether that's biodiversity, other aspects in which you're including in that target equity, et cetera. Um, but in terms of you know, mitigation and emissions, it really starts with that greenhouse gas emission inventory. And the emission inventory is a key tool for um, robustly communicating and monitoring progress over time. Tabare mentioned the CDP ICLA reporting platform. Um, you know, there's now more scrutiny and more uh, encouragement for cities to be communicating uh, their emissions over time through that reporting platform. Uh, you know, it's, it's more and more linked to you know, other users of that data, whether we're talking about you know, city city actors like WWF, it, it clay C40 WRI, or if we're talking about academics in the space, or we're talking about UN data platforms, yeah, you know, there's more and more um, data initiatives cropping up to, that are using all non-state actor data, and that includes cities, local governments, etc. Um, you know, thinking about the, the open access data portal, which was launched at COP. Um, by Emmanuel Macron and uh, Mayor Bloomberg, yeah, there, there's more and more um, tools and data coming up at every COP oriented towards 
supporting city level practitioners, but also aggregating data from cities and producing analysis that feeds uh, you know, things that go into the COP UNFCCC process, but also uh, other, other sources. And that really reiterates the need for um, you know, robust and reliable data, uh, but it's also a need for the cities themselves to have that so that they can um, you know, compare themselves reliably to, to what other cities are doing so that they can accurately understand what's happening in the boundary of the city. And I think, you know, to expand on that a little bit about uh, the city practitioner level and having reliable, robust data, yeah, this is really a kind of journey over time. It's not uh, a greenhouse gas emission inventory. It shouldn't be something that's done on a one-off to produce a plan and then never done again. And then when it is done again, it's done with completely different data sets and it's not comparable to the previous inventory that was done in the original plan. There's an element of consistency over time and that you know, feeds into the scientific robustness. And a lot of those principles are laid out in the GHG protocol for cities around how to you know, manage data quality over time and ensure consistency and accuracy uh, as some of the key principles in the GHG protocol for community-wide emissions, uh, which we shortened to the GPC. I'd recommend anyone looking to you know, get started on an emission inventory to have a look at that. Um, that's the you know, international, internationally accepted protocol for which you know, cities are, are accounting and reporting for their emissions. Um, and yeah, I'd say that principles, consistency, accuracy, and that's you know, relevant over time, and public disclosure through the reporting platforms is a really important mechanism to demonstrate transparency, leadership, and communicate the progress uh, towards your science-based target, towards your uh, the goals that you've established in your climate action plan. So your emission inventory is kind of the first step of that cycle, and it's also your tool for monitoring and communicating um, once you have your climate action plan. So I mentioned a little bit that you know, climate action plans for cities are not just about emissions. Obviously, the, the, the main topic of this webinar is we're talking about science-based targets for cities, and that's mostly uh, a conversation around emissions and mitigation. But with this slide, I want to flag that you know, robust climate action planning at a city level is not just about a science-based target, although you know, we obviously want the most robust science-based mitigation targets that we can. Uh, and there's you know, emerging literature about uh, about how, robust, how, how targets could be more robust or how they could include new aspects such as you know, interim targets every five years or specific targets at, aimed at ending the use of fossil fuels. Yeah, there's emerging literature because it's a vast moving space around um, increasing robustness of science-based targets. But in the context of city level climate action planning, yeah, that's definitely one of the core priorities. But I'd say the other three core priorities are really around, you know, here we've got adaptation, what's, what's termed resilience to climate hazards. Yeah, and in some cities, that might be uh, equal to or more important than a, an ambitious mitigation target. Thinking about Tabare's graph there, where we showed um, cities primarily equatorial or in the global south that may have less responsibility over emissions, but are the ones that most face the impacts of climate change. For those cities, you know, if they have a very small um, footprint of emissions, uh, all those countries you know, that have very small forecast of growth in emissions, uh, uh, ambitious targets and actions around building resilience is, is really vital for those cities. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that should also consider how climate hazards are changing over time. Uh, we talk a lot about how emissions targets should be you know, forecasted into the future and should bear in mind city growth as well as you know, technology change and strategies. That's similar for the adaptation space as well. Um, thinking about those countries highlighted in the graph, they need to be thinking about how you know, the core climate hazards which they're facing, whether that's drought, wildfires, et cetera, are gonna change over the next 20, 30 years and beyond uh, as the, the, the climate warms, hopefully <laughs> uh, less as possible. Um, but you know that's a key aspect of robust adaptation planning. Two other elements that I would highlight, um, inclusivity and benefits. I guess um, the term inclusivity and benefits um, is, 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 is phrased towards communicating the co-benefits of climate action. What are the other things that come with implementing ambitious, robust climate actions that achieve you know, change at scale? What does that also do for things like mortality, air quality, um, you know, other co-benefits within the city? But I think there's also uh, uh, examples where those, those what we call benefits 
could be you know reframed to be really central to the, the, the implementation of a climate action plan. For example, I've been working recently with cities in in India, and um, we're working with you know some large cities in India on their first climate action plan. But you know, air pollution is such a big problem for the major cities in India that you know they might have uh, you know teams within the city dedicated to air quality already, where they might not have a climate action team. So you know, making the links between emissions, air quality in that context, I think kind of goes beyond this notion of co-benefits and really is about um, connecting the dots between climate action and really vital, important other aspects within the city. Um, especially when we're talking about cities where there's not someone within the boundary of that city that's not impacted by uh, air pollution you know, every day. So that can really help to connect the plan to citizens within the boundary. It can really help to connect it with uh, national state government priorities, whether that's on air pollution in India, um, or whether that's on you know vulnerable populations in other contexts, whether that's on um, you know enabling uh, communities that are impoverished, or whether that's on um, you know empowering women in vulnerable situations. Yeah, I think that the co-benefits aspect is really vital to tailoring the a climate action plan to the context of a city. Um, it can really connect. Yeah, you know, the ideas of science-based targets to the realities on the ground, um, because we know that you know climate action is so interconnected to this this web of social environmental issues um, that that framing of what's called here co-benefits, but yeah, you know, really is city context issues and how those are impacted by climate action is really vital. The fourth one on the on the the diagram here is on governance and collaboration. I'll touch on that a little bit in the next slide, but I think. Um, yeah, this is so vitally key to the implementation of a climate action plan. You know, you could have the most perfect technical climate action plan that has the most robust emission science-based target, the best adaptation actions and evidence base, and you know the uh, most incredible framing and analysis of inclusivity and co-benefits of that plan. But if that's not you know, owned by the city leaders and it's not got clear delegation to city departments and ownership by people within the boundary of well, within the organization of the city but also actors within the community of the the city boundary then it's not going to create the change at scale that it's intending to um so it's really important for uh, city practitioners to work on ensuring that the plan has strong governance internally uh that engagement with stakeholders is not just something that is kind of a bolt on, but really should be thought of throughout the entire process to maximize the impact of the plan on the ground um, for the city and for the wider community. Um, have a quick check, how am I doing for time? Oh, uh, not very good. Um, so I'll, I'm, I'm gonna touch fairly quickly through these next slides. So uh, I would say that this diagram, there's kind of a lot to digest here, but I would say, you know, it's really kind of split into two where the colorful columns are your the steps in producing your climate action plan and the grayer ones are once you have your plan, implementing it, monitoring it and, and completing the circle back to, you know, revisiting uh, further down the line in, a, in whether it's a four or five year cycle, the implementation of your plan. Um, and yeah, there's some really key steps in here. This is a, a chart that we use with, with our C40 cities to explain the climate action planning process, but I'm sure there's similar charts used by the uh, other colleagues on the call at ICLEA, WWF and CDP, because you know, the, the, this journey, um, you, can, you can kind of dice it up and present it in lots of different ways, but effectively there's a lot of the key elements that go into producing a robust climate action plan. Yeah, it's important to lay the groundwork, which is highlighted in the first column here, to get that buy-in from the senior level people in the city to make sure this is gonna be impactful, establish the right team, have people on the ground, you know, understand what you're working with before you kind of start the actual journey of compiling a plan. Highlighted in, in red here, I've got the emission inventory um, and you know, modeling basically through identifying strategies over time, but also within your evidence bases, your adaptation and inclusivity, you know, for those, those elements I mentioned around co-benefits and adaptation. And then in the, 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 the bluer column, establishing those targets, creating the plan, developing stakeholder-led actions. But I wanted to touch on the, the bottom arrows before I move on, because I think that you know, these are arguably the most important aspects of this whole diagram uh, of the process of a city putting together a, a robust climate action plan. I mentioned a little bit about it before, but you know, stakeholder engagement is really something that should be occurring throughout the process. It should be um, 
really targeting how the plan can be as impactful as possible and is you know, serving the people which it's designed to serve, right? That is going to include city departments and it's going to include you know, people in the transport, energy and waste team. But if you don't bring those departments on side, when the plan's produced, you know, the worst case scenario is it sits on a shelf and those departments don't take up on those, those evidence-based robust actions that you've identified to deliver on the goals of the Paris Agreement. So that is a really, really key element. Um, and engaging your community, equally vital, um, depending on you know, your context and how, you, how cities are used to going about engaging communities. Yeah, that varies depending on what cities are like, but um, really vital aspects. And I wanted to highlight that as part of this process. On this slide, I just wanted to highlight that CAPS can take any kind of format, really, whether you cities decide to have separate adaptation mitigation plans or plans that are informed by state level plans. This is really to highlight that the, the form it takes and the governance should just be the most impactful that it can for your city. So where do we go from here in terms of climate action planning and targets? I won't go into this in too much detail because I know I'm a little bit pressed for time, but Tabare mentioned our work with the Science-Based Targets Network. You know, we're aiming to produce more guidance that can support local government, governments on science-based targets. Um, and I think some of that might be informed by this developing space around credibility for net zero. Some recommendations for reading there uh, from the, the UN's high level expert group for net zero and the ISO guiding principles for net zero, which both made publications at COP26 on the topic. And I'll leave you with the chart on the right, which shows, you know, a kind of visual representation that for every year we are not peaking global emissions, the year in which we need to reach net zero comes back by two years. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Apologies if I went a little bit over time there, Marika. Um, but I guess I'll hand back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ryan. No worries for going over time. We're good. We're good on time. I think thanks so much. This, it's lovely to see that snapshot. It's also lovely to see how much we do things in the same way uh, across the city city networks. Um, and I, I just wanted to stress to everybody the, ex, the excitement one can have and the fun one can have in developing an action plan. It's, a, it's an enormously creative space. Um, Ryan alluded to the, the co-benefits, the benefits beyond the climate impact, which is actually at the heart of the fun space. We know we need to reduce our impact on climate change through climate change mitigation. We know we need to be more resilient, but you need to bring all your people, all your stakeholders, um, your governance aspects, um, many consultations. So it's a very interactive space across all the sectors and all the themes. And I think that's that's what for us at least uh, makes this exciting. And um, the partnership that we've created in this climate space uh, across many of the partners, um, I will zoom in on some of that messaging now uh, in my slide deck. So let me quickly share my screen and then we can take a look. I wanted to very much look at um, there are so many initiatives and I will not speak to all of them, but I wanted to speak to some of them to um, help you understand where the interconnections are. So you've heard about the Global Covenant of Mayors that was mentioned uh, very briefly. So the Global Covenant of Mayors is at, at the moment more than 12,000 committed local governments and their cities uh, are part of this space. So they commit and essentially join the, this global alliance. It was created, I think, nearly nine years ago already, and it was very much aimed at looking at climate change, mitigation, also adaptation and access to energy. And in 2023, you'll hear much more about access to energy and the resilience side of things as well. Um, but this helped very much pull together the partnership. So we have, it's a huge partnership, including C40, um, WWF and many others. And it's an exciting partnership space because this is where we're trying to get the latest, anything that's developing, the latest updates come in through the Global Covenant so that you can get your updates there. Um, it very much showcases the importance of, sub, of specifically city level action and city is regardless of size. So it could be a small village, it could be a mega city and anything in between. Um, so definitely recommend it if you're from a local government, explore committing there. ECLA's support package actually serves the global covenant as well uh, as does the work of C40 um, and our other partners. Now, the race to zero and specifically also then the city's race to zero came later. This was something coming more from the, the advocacy space. So the high level champions that are connected to the climate negotiations decided to launch this call for a race to zero 
because we are not on track with our collective ag aggregated emissions reduction. If you're looking at all the nationally determined contributions, we're not on track. And the intention here was to bring the non-state actors, so, so state actors are the national governments, uh, to bring all of those, the rest of us, together to push ambition and make our own commitments. It connects to the Global Covenant of Mayo, so it's not disconnected, um, but it's very much uh, focused on a global push towards climate neutrality. And I think that is an exciting space. Again, you can sign up to the global, both the Global Covenant of Mayors and to the Race to Zero, and you do the reporting in one place through CDP Eclat Track. So there isn't um, an additional burden. The burden is on you as a, as a local government to step up collectively within your city. And again, that's where the support from the different partners uh, are available. So an important initiative. Now, there's a Another side to this, which is the race to resilience. Unfortunately, in my view, they've split the two. Um, race to resilience is specifically making sure that um, all the vulnerable communities, um, businesses, spaces, territories are also um, seriously considered. And then there's the equivalent of the city's race to zero is the city's race to resilience, which is led by ICLA, again, in a nice partnership space. So please look into committing to these. Um, they will open up different doors for you and different opportunities um, as well. Now, you've heard a lot about the science-based target network. That's very much to look at the science and making sure that we underpin our net zero work in, in the most robust way possible. And this will evolve. Hopefully, we'll, we'll come up with wonderful new guidance and support. Um, and this is also planned from next year onwards. Now, um, I believe essentially um, air quality is a piece that connects connects to climate. So I wanted to stress that there is a climate and clean air coalition. In my view, no need to, as a city representative, to, to become a member there because you'll get that support uh, also through the Global Covenant of Mayors and ICLA and others. But it is an important place where national governments have taken this topic outside of the uh, UNFCCC negotiations. So they wanted to depoliticize it, if you will, to really look at practical actions, how to reduce short-lived climate pollutants um, like black carbon, like methane. And these are important climate forces which we need to look at. Um, so it's beyond carbon dioxide, but looking really at stepping up action. And there's some wonderful uh, support coming out of that group as well. Um, ICLA is, is a partner there. I believe C40 is a partner there. So again, you'll get the message and the support coming out of that space through the networks. I wanted to stress then one specific initiative, um, which is really interesting in this conversation about moving away from fossil fuels and nuclear energy towards 100% renewable energy. There is a global platform called the 100% uh, gl global renewable energies uh, with, the, with the link you see there. That is a group of associations who've clubbed together. So you've got associations dealing with wind energy, with geothermal energy, uh, with wave and tidal power. All of that, them have come together to create the space to, to help understand how you can reach the 100% renewable space. And we've uh, developed and are working on building blocks to give that guidance specifically also to the local and regional governments. And ICLA, under that umbrella, ICLA is running the 100% Renewable Cities and Regions Network. So this is very much an energy focused piece. Um, it's also available open for free to join. So if you commit, if you join, you're basically committing that you will explore 100% renewable energy in your territory and highly recommended in any case that you check if you, what is your re local renewable energy potential, of course, that has to form the heart of your climate plan um, in any case. So again, that's a nice, a nice connection. And the last one that I wanted to zoom on, um, which I now, sorry, I'm now going back instead of forward, sorry, <laughs> in the other direction, is the Sustainable Development Goals. There is, of course, a big movement specifically led with UCLG under localizing the SDGs. You can report on this through different platforms. CDP Eclat Track covers some of that, but not everything. But of course, climate is part of the SDGs, as are local communities. Um, so a very interesting space for any subnational government to also look at localizing the SDGs in your territory. It's confusing, but it's an interesting space. So if you're if you're curious about getting more information, 
And there are, in, there are many initiatives way beyond these that I've now shown you as well, but I would like you to take a look and see if you can step up by making that commitment and then getting the additional support. Now, I'll come quickly to ICLE. Um, ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, is our long name. We're working with more than 2,500 local and regional governments committed to sustainable urban development, which includes climate action, of course, and we're working across more than 125 countries. Um, our work is very much globally defined and designed, but then we implement in a regional context um, and in, at a national level. And at the moment, through our collective projects and activities, we're impacting 20% of the global population. That's the fun piece. Now, I'll take you to the specifically to our approach um, on climate neutrality. So we have five entry points when you can work with ICLE, um as a, as a subnational government. Low emission development is, of course, a, clearly a climate stream, but also nature-based development, also equitable and people-centered development, focusing very much on the just transition, looking also at resilient development, although that's way broader than climate, and looking at circular development, again, broader than climate. So all of these are interconnected in our climate work, and we, we're at the moment working on connecting the guidance that we um, of pulling together and we'll make that available uh, on a platform for next year. Now, one way that ICLA works is operating not just with you as a local or a regional government, but helping you to understand how to work with your neighbors in a region. So at the moment, I'm sitting in Bonn. How does Bonn work with its neighboring communities? Many of them are rural or forestry or agriculture communities. Then there are some big neighboring cities. Helping think not just for your own particular territory, which is important, but also interconnecting because your waste streams are probably interconnected, your mobility options are interconnected. So there's wonderful opportunities to step up together and working by working together. Now, ICLA does a lot of things. So I just wanted to, through this very simple image, give you a sense of what you're getting if you're looking working with us on climate, but also on any other topic. So um, we, we capacitate and we guide local and regional governments. That's our core constituency to help you with your planning, with your action and accessing finance. We also support you with reporting uh, to help you track your own impact because that's the piece that actually is interesting to your, to your city council or your regional council. What are we doing that is actually having an impact? And we, we enable that space for you. We also bring um, innovation and research results to you. Um, many of our local and regional governments also have their own research um, institutions. So these connect to us so that we can upscale collectively to see what's new, what's cutting edge that we can move on. Of course, Showcasing the action, showcasing good practices and leadership is part of what we do um, at our events um, and especially also at the COPs like the Climate COP or the Biodiversity COP um, that is uh, just happening. And the last two points, enabling peer learning and sharing and networking, I think it's one of the things we're most known for in addition to the technical work. Peer learning is an interesting space because that's where your mayor can connect to another mayor or your counselor on dealing with biodiversity can connect to his or her counterparts. That's where we want to really get people to find a partnership space and evolve that partnership within the ICLA family to get in a confident space where you know you're not alone. All of us are working on incredibly important topics that really will impact on the future of this planet. And it's sometimes quite isolating. So really getting your colleagues to work with you and knowing you can reach out to people is a really important part. And of course, we advocate together with all our partners on helping the national governments to set up more enabling frameworks, frameworks that not just allow action, but that actively, proactively support sustainable urban development. Now, I couldn't actually fit the whole global support offer of our climate uh, work on one slide. So I'm just giving you a snapshot of some of the highlights. So our Green Climate Cities program is very much our global climate impact program. It's available for free for any subnational government to join. And our focus there is very much on helping you understand the process. Um, some of what Ryan mentioned is also um, implemented through, through ICLE, and I will take you through that a little bit later. But there's, that's where we centralize our guidance and tools and capacity building offer to 
analyze, act, and accelerate. Under the umbrella of the Green Climate Cities Program, we're pushing now and stepping up our climate neutrality support. Um, and all of that is connected to CDP Ecolite Track, where we're mobilizing reporting with the support of, of CDP, um, who's leading on that space, but also very much working with WWF in the One Planet City Challenge, for example, which is a fantastic competitive space, getting more robust reporting to show, to help us understand what's really moving in this world. We have an online solutions gateway where we're centralizing all our support. And of course, we have the transformative actions program, which links to the access to finance. And I will zoom in on the access to finance piece, because I think that's where we're getting most of our questions at the moment. So this is our framework, our GCC framework, um, looking at analyzing, acting and accelerating. And this unfolds as a process methodology. So we've got a couple of rings around that, each taking you deeper and deeper. Um, for example, uh, Ryan mentioned developing a greenhouse gas inventory. We also recommend developing a climate risk and vulnerability assessment, of course, uh, biodiversity mapping. You need to look at how much is your local renewable energy potential. You need to understand your key sectors and where are um, the, the possible elements where you can enhance resilience at the sectoral level. And last but not least, and this is quite often underestimated, with climate change happening globally, do you know if there would be climate migration to your territory? Um, make sure, bring in your researchers to help you unpack that particular piece, because if your city is growing, for example, um, you would need to commensurately grow your basic services like access to energy, access to clean water, uh, and so on. So the climate migration piece is an important component that we need to better understand, and we will zoom in on that in the future as well. I wanted to specifically focus and share with you the new the guide on connecting green recovery and resilience in cities, which we developed together with GIZ um, Resilience Cities Network, as well as Cities Alliance. This is a, a very nice document that brings it that green build back better perspective, which is a quite a nice one um, as well. I've already spoken about the GCC. The interesting piece here is we're working, helping you understand in your own governmental operations what you can do, but of course also the citywide planning, working with your citizens, your businesses and industry across all the sectors. Uh, that is an important piece. Of course, many subnational governments know that what they can do in their own operations. Um, that's the easy work. That's the low-hanging fruit as well. But working with your whole community is uh, indeed more challenging but also, again, that's the exciting space where one can step up collectively and brainstorm and be very innovative as well. Just monitoring the time, we're running a little bit over. So for ICLA, we decided that resilient development is our overarching umbrella. Again, that's our starting point. And we bring in climate change resilient under that climate change adaptation as well as mitigation. And our support on climate neutrality is, of course, building on the science-based targets work drastically reducing emissions to net zero, divesting from fossil fuels and repurposing and reinvesting into clean, green, sustainable solutions. And as an absolute last resort, offsetting and compensating greenhouse gas emissions now that you cannot switch or move, remove right away. Quite often this relates to the energy sector where local or regional governments do not have a mandate on energy yet. Um, they can change things in their own operations, but not so easily in their community. Too. So helping to think of offsetting until such time as one can switch to clean and green energy, for example. We talk about many topics. Um, good governance was mentioned earlier. Um, I also want to highlight sustainable public procurement as a wonderful space where one can move very fast um, and do quite innovative things um, in terms of spending your money from a government perspective very efficiently. To join the GCC program, um, you just let, it, let us know. It's free. Um, it also connects. So the same approach is used in the Global Covenant of Mayors, the same similar approach is used in the Race to Zero. So we're not asking you to do anything outside what you're already committing to if you're committing to these global initiatives. And we can give a um, wonderful range of services there as well. Briefly zooming on, on the, the support for finance, um, we have our transformative actions program. Um, we have 16 partners uh, who are working with us here to help access finance for local infrastructure projects. So our TAP 
is a project pipeline, but it's also a project preparation facility where we give support, technical support to help you unpack your project and make it a bit more robust so that it's actually financeable. And it's an advocacy instrument that links to our global work where we're working, of course, to call for more and faster efficient access to subnational governments to upscale their climate ambitions. Now, the TAP is a very successful program we're running. We have a current pipeline of 2.5 billion euros seeking investment and support um, with 70 four projects in total in the pipeline and our 16 partners and what what do we do here in the tap so we're calling for projects that are ambitious but also inclusive and cross-cutting those are the core requirements that's the transformational piece as well we have an annual call we support uh, and screen your concept when you submit it our pipeline is closing today We'll reopen it early next next year again and make um, recommendations. If your concept isn't robust enough, in our view, we make recommendations and then we pull your project into the pipeline if you have um, adapted it to our recommendations and then you access our support. I've put a few links here to some of the support that we offer. Um, brand new is the CCFLA Financial Instruments Toolkit. Please do take a look. The link should be active. We'll also promote that through some of our publications. And there's a new public-private partnership toolkit, of course, as well. These are our current partners. Um, it's a wonderful partnership space. Um, we also are exploring with each of the partners what can they do um, with their particular support. And um, uh, exciting things are moving uh, in this space as well. So uh, again, watch our news for 2023. I'm not going to run to the details here, um, but we are also supporting beyond the local and regional governments. We're also supporting, of course, the national governments to help them bring that subnational contribution to the, the NDC or the NAPS, the National Adaptation Plans, the National um, Determined Contributions. These cannot step up their ambition if they do not bring that subnational component into them. And we work with many, many partners to uh, calling for catalyzing and scaling up finance for subnationals. This has been the biggest weakness in the global system that many local governments may not um, access uh, international finance. Uh, sometimes they may not even take on loans. So there is a real systems problem that we have there. And we're trying to see how to fix that step by step. Um, calling also on uh, the fact that we have we need to finance the climate emergency now. And um, what we released at the COP was quite exciting, working together with UNCDF and FMDV, um, the call to action on financing the climate emergency. We use a lot of abbreviations, but go and take a look to see what they mean. We will unpack them also. Uh, it's a, the climate space is a space of abbreviations as well. Wonderful technical guidance that we're giving online, uh, also through our online solutions gateway, which we developed together with UN Habitat. Um, I wanted to just at the end here share with you, the reporting is a very important piece of the puzzle for us. Um, if you report, we can also review what you're doing and see where maybe you're missing some opportunities and put you in touch with next steps to, especially if you're um, targeting climate neutrality, uh, you will need more creative ideas and we are happy from ECLASI to share our thoughts and perspectives on that as well. If you do not report, we do not know what you're doing and that means we cannot give you robust recommendations from our side. So I would like to wrap up there. Um, we've run a little bit over time, so there's not unfortunately too much time for questions, um, but let me stop here and um, have a chat with my colleagues. Um, I see Ryan had to leave, if I'm not mistaken. So then we, um, myself and Tabare are available for you in case you have any questions or comments. Sorry, that was a very dense set of information. Um, that's the challenge of climate change. We get all excited and then we put in too many slides, don't we, Tabare? Um, so I would like to open the floor. I don't see any questions in our, um, FAQ at the moment. So maybe Tabare, I'd like to maybe ask, check in with you. Um, I know I know roughly what WWF is doing. Um, in terms of next year, the scaling up around the science-based targets piece, is there anything you'd like to share? What What is our plan for next year? Is there anything we may share at this stage? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a great um, a question. 
uh, within the uh, collective effort that these organizations, uh, C40, ECLE, uh, WRI, CDP, uh, WF, and, and the GCOM we're doing in, in this relationship, uh, I, I will summarize it in three things. Uh, first one, we want to continue supporting, guiding the cities towards finding their ways to define these science-based targets. And that implies in the technical orientation on how to develop these targets, what targets fit better to their specific conditions based on methodological assumptions. So that's one, like technical orientation. The second one is that we are committed to transparency and accountability. So we are revising these targets, those that are being published. So we are kind of verifying, checking that these are really uh, fulfilling their, the, the claims of, of alignment with, with science. So I think that's the, the second part, transparency and accountability. And the final one that it is a little bit uh, associated to SVT, but not necessarily an SVT thing. Uh, in order to have uh, transparency and accountability and in order to apply good methods, we need robust information, information that is accessible to everyone, information that can be easily and public, publicly openly reported. So one of the uh, preconditions for science-based target, uh, a robust science-based target setting is to disclose information. So I think we, our partners are very committed in creating uh, continuous support for cities to report publicly uh, in their preferent, uh, uh, preference of platforms. Uh, e CDP EK track could be, or my covenant. But the important thing is that cities uh, are very welcome to continue their extraordinary force in reporting climate data and information and that they are not alone. Uh, uh, the same way we recognize that there's a significant role in cities to play uh, in improving the state of climate and reducing emissions, we also recognize that there are efforts associated and the collective support of our organization is really keen, really willing, and is celebrating to give you that support and to accompany you towards that process of defining targets and reporting publicly, transparently, and accountably the information that it is useful for you and your citizens to know what you're doing in terms of climate action. So I will stop there, uh, Marika. Thanks, Tavari. That's that's very helpful. I think the transparency piece is a hot discussion uh, currently in the corporate space. Uh, we did, we want to avoid, of course, greenwashing. And I think, as in the space of subnationals, we've been leading through the having the global protocol for community scale greenhouse gas emission inventories, and then the next step was the science-based targets um, network. So we're scaling up, and that will evolve, and there will be a very exciting evolution coming to help you know, enhance that transparency. I think I'd like to wrap up today. I think uh, with a call to all, please. Join us, uh, join forces. Um, we, in a partnership space, uh, looking at subnationals of climate action, are there to help you. There's a wonderful opportunity to learn more, to share more, and I think we need to definitely step up collectively to achieve um, our climate neutrality goals. 2050 is too late for that. Set your climate neutrality goals for earlier. Um, and reach out to us so that we can also explore with you what are your particular needs to help you move forward uh, on delivering your particular commitment. So thank you so much and wishing everybody a wonderful end of the year. Stay safe. Bye-bye.